Don't forget to visit marketingcasts.com to find even more custom curated marketing podcasts just like this one. That's marketingcasts.com. Hi, this is Sean Halter, host of the CMO Suite Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and catch up on all the previous episodes at www.thecmosuite.com. This episode of the CMO Suite is brought to you by Uconnex. Uconnex provides digital solutions and teams to brand CMOs, VPs, and marketers looking for true transparency in the biddable media space. From paid social and PPC to complex platforms like the Trade Desk, brands from across the world have connected to Uconnex. Visit them today at Uconnex.com and No Kid Hungry. We're proud to promote No Kid Hungry and their many initiatives to help kids in need of meals. Visit them at NoKidHungry.org. This episode of the CMO Suite is also brought to you by Winmo. Winmo is the most comprehensive and widely used advertising database, providing an unfair advantage to media and marketing professionals nationwide. Winmo tracks every national advertiser, their agency relationships, and key executives within each organization. Get instant media spend, competitor tracking, and industry trend analysis in one easy-to-use application that integrates with all major CRM platforms. CMO Suite listeners receive complimentary trials of Winmo just by visiting winmo.com backslash CMO Suite. Finally, the CMO Suite is presented by the CMOCouncil.org as their official marketer's podcast. The Chief Marketing Officer Council is the only global network of executives specifically dedicated to high-level knowledge exchange, thought leadership, and personal relationship building among senior corporate marketing leaders and brand decision makers. The CMO Council's 15,000 plus members control more than $550 billion dollars aggregated annual marketing expenditures, and run complex distributed marketing and sales operations worldwide. For more information on membership, visit thecmocouncil.org. Let's start the show. You're in the CMO Suite, the podcast for marketers who want to be in the know. Presented by Connectivity Holdings. You are listening to the CMO Suite. This is your host, Sean Halter. We are kicking off season five, as you are all well aware, and I am super excited to have as our guest today, is Christopher Stadler. Chris is the Chief Marketing Officer at Tonal. I'm excited to talk to him about all things Tonal. He is uh, lucky in some ways because he is uh, working out of Hawaii right now. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be here. What part of uh, Hawaii are you in right now? Uh, I am in Kauai for a week. I've spent some time there. I, we've uh, been to the North Shore several times and we were at the Big Island a couple of years ago. It's absolutely... Yeah. Stunningly, stunningly beautiful. It's uh, some of my you know, my favorite places in the world. And at the same time, we also realized that um, that we both live or lived uh, for some time kind of uh, down the street from each other. So I've lived in St. Pete, Florida, which is uh, just outside of Tampa, for those of you not entirely familiar. And you lived uh, here uh, for quite a while as well, about five or six years. I did just down the street from you in uh, downtown St. Pete, right on the water there. I was working as a scheme of Ironman for six years and had a great experience there and really, really enjoyed St. Pete. Uh, great town. It's been going through a lot of refurbishment and it's an awesome place to live. No, Chris, it's a horrible place to live. Please, people, <laughs> if you're thinking of moving somewhere, you do not want to move here. It is, no, it is, there's no housing. There's no, they don't have grocery stores here, people. So please, please just take St. Pete, mark it right off your list. If somebody tells you that St. Pete is the Austin of Florida, they are wrong. Please don't come. Do not come. It's, a, um, it's an undiscovered gem for sure. Indeed. Well, let's leave that as, as a as semi a secret as we can. So talk to me sure. about where you grew up. You lived here uh, in Florida for five or six years, but where did you grow up? I did. I grew up in Miami and Coral Gables um, and spent most of my life there. Um, went to Moved up to Duke for college and then up to New York City for the biggest stint of my career. So you grew up in Miami. How about your parents? What did your folks do? Uh, my dad uh, was and is in real estate. He's a developer in Florida. Uh, my mom was a school teacher and uh, grew up in Miami uh, and really uh, got, a, got a good glimpse into business through the lens of my dad's business, brothers uh, which was really fascinating. Brothers and sisters down there as well? Two younger sisters, one's in Orlando and one is in Atlanta. So the family's mostly in the Southeast. And you were the one who decided you were going to move away and go to school. So growing up in Miami, are they, are either of them of Cuban descent or are they, are they uh, American and ended up down in Miami around the same time? Or, or how was that? Uh, they are not of Cuban descent, uh, but we did learn Spanish uh, at quite a young age. So I remember taking Spanish in first grade and learned uh, the word butterfly, mariposa. Was, uh... <laughs> I, knew, I knew beer and cerveza, so you know cerveza you, could, is good. you could see where our two paths have crossed. Yeah, you know when I was <laughs> when I was in uh, media sales for quite a while, I used to call on the Miami market, so I was down there every month. This was I'm old, I'm 51, so you know this was in the days, you know before iPhones. So you had to speak Spanish 
down there. You know, if you really wanted to get around, you really did need to speak Spanish to navigate your way through that city. But stunningly, stunningly beautiful city. So you certainly grew up in a pretty amazing environment. And so what took you to Duke? Was it a specific interest in marketing or in anything specific that, that took you there? At, at the time, um, I had seen Dead Poet Society and thought, oh, I wanted to be an, 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 thought I wanted to be an English teacher and uh, just was so inspired by Robin Williams in that film. Um, and Duke had a great English program. Uh, I went there, uh, fell in love with a lot of uh, professors there, uh, finished that major in a couple of years and ended up getting a double major in psychology which was really my first foray into understanding how people think. Uh, I worked in the cognitive psychology laboratory there. And I think that was some of the early uh, seedlings of my, my love of marketing, really. You know, we could spend a half an hour just on Dead Poet Society, literally my favorite movie <laughs> of all time. I watched it again, maybe a year ago. Just, I think I just fell in love with everything watching that yeah. movie. What a great, 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 amazing performance. But it's interesting that you had a psychology background coming into marketing because really mm -hmm. marketing in many ways is about just that it's about helping to uh, usually in in mostly positive ways helping you to shape ideas and thoughts and processes and helping consumers to um, you know listen to the story that you're trying to tell to some extent so I'm assuming then you kind of dovetailed off of that and then I saw at some point you ended up after graduating you ended up at Procter and Gamble I did I went to Michigan for grad school got my MBA there uh, really got some fundamentals of marketing uh, from an academic perspective. Uh, was an intern at PNG in Cincinnati. Never thought I would live in the Midwest, but uh, it would be great to get PNG on my resume. And really fell in love with the company. And I ended up staying for six years. Uh, became a brand manager. Was working in the laundry detergent division, which was uh, was and is the largest uh, group at the time. Uh, worked on iconic brands like Tide and Pantene shampoo, and really um, was was a perfect training ground. Uh, to immerse myself in the, in the function. You know, it's probably good for you and I that they didn't have social media back then because I grew up in Cincinnati. I lived in Cincinnati uh, until around 1987. But, you know, with the path that you carried, and I, I still go back quite often, your time there and then your time kind of here, there's probably like 10 photos of you and I at the same place together at some point that if you look through, <laughs> you'd be like, I, God, I feel like I know that guy. I I feel like I know that guy. What did you think of Cincinnati? I grew up there uh, until until '87, and then was uh, smart and kind of got out of the got out of the cold. But I always thought I would work at PNG. I never did, but a great city. It's it's a great city. Mount Adams, where I lived, was was an awesome oh place God. to grow up. We're gonna and, have to talk uh, after my, this because in my twenties. <laughs> my sister has like eight apartments in Mount Adams. That's so weird, man. That's so weird when those kind of small worldy things happen. So you lived in Mount Adams while you worked at PNG. It is. It is. I, I absolutely loved every minute of PNG. It was really a great experience. I uh, was in Cincinnati for four years of it and then actually worked on a project with Walmart and moved up to Bentonville, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Wow. Uh, was meant to go for only for six months and ended up staying two and a half years. We had, um, um, we had Cynthia Kleinbaum from Walmart Plus on talking about Walmart. What a fascinating, fascinating company. Yeah, it was, it was also a great experience and getting a glimpse into that world and and, and the, the buying power they have, the impact they have on, on shoppers and the shopping experience, really extraordinary. Tell us about that for just a, a few minutes, if you don't mind. What was that project and, and how did it end up going from six months to four years? Well, I started um, as the hair care and hair color uh, brand manager working exclusively on the Walmart customer team. And then uh, really enjoyed that experience, got to know the buyer very well and, and that whole process and the decisions that are made and, and the, the KPIs that are important. And then also uh, moved into a, a hybrid role where I worked on uh, innovation uh, between P&G and Walmart. So we had uh, TV screens on the end caps as an example that would play uh, commercials and, and ads for the product that was on the end cap. And so really working with you know, in-store radio, in-store TV and pushing the boundaries of, of the shopping experience and really trying to think differently about about that was was part of my role that was really cool. It is amazing when you can work with a company like Walmart that does allow simply because of heft and size to some extent and forward thinkers when when that's what you end up with there that you can really you can push the boundary sometimes. You can often say, well this may not be how it's normally done, but let's figure out how to do this. And they do seem to have these amazing relationships with their agencies and their partners and the brands that they work with to often really create those synergies that sometimes maybe you still today don't see as much as it probably could be done or should be done. Yeah. 
And, you know, for in some of my categories, uh, Walmart accounted for between 30 and 40 percent of sales. And so the extent to which we were able to develop deep, trusting, committed partnerships with them, you know, in some cases that meant an exclusive SKU or, or product. Um, but winning with Walmart really meant that the brand won. And I think some of those lessons and learnings have helped me develop strong partnerships today. You know, we often when we're talking with people on the show, we talk about you know, their history, the way that they've navigated their way through. I do feel like that common theme is always just building strong relationships. It doesn't matter how much mm -hmm. data you have in the world, what great piece of software that you're out there using, relationships mm -hmm. still win because it allows you to build trust. And ultimately at the end of the day, we, we got to kind of trust, you know, each other in this space to some extent. So as you navigated mm -hmm. out of uh, Procter & Gamble, you stayed in the uh, hair care space to some extent, I guess. And, and headed over to uh, 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 Ralph Lauren, am I correct? Yeah, I actually- so I guess I it moved was more fragrances to, then, huh? Yeah, I moved back to New York City. I uh, was a VP of marketing for Ralph Lauren Fragrances, uh, which was obviously an incredibly iconic brand, something that I had, a brand that I had grown up with and loved uh, my whole life. Uh, and to be able to work on the fragrance portfolio was really uh, incredible. And, you know, of course, to meet occasionally with Ralph himself, uh, develop, you know, new products, uh, great old standbys like polo blue polo black the original green polo that, you know that we all used as kids uh and really drive that portfolio to the next level um, was very different from png png was more about functional marketing product features and benefits and l'oreal and ralph lauren fragrances a category in particular was really about selling a dream you know it cost a few dollars to make a fragrance and we would sell it between you know eighty dollars and and up to you know Twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars. Those margins really are bad. The margins are not bad, and you're selling a dream. And so that was that was a big shift for me that I very much enjoyed. But it probably pushed you outside of your comfort zone to some extent, because again, now you really have to tell a story, and you got to meet, you know, somebody incredibly iconic. You know, there's only a handful of of those kinds of people that we'll probably know in our lifetimes. You said you got a chance to actually meet with Ralph at times as part of uh, being in the position. Absolutely. Anytime we had a new product or initiative that would need to get approved, and we would we would meet with him and his team, uh, and they were they were great partners. You know, back to the earlier point of partnerships. You know, building trust, um, build, building strong credibility, and, and common interests and goals were really paramount to to making those projects work. And so, as you work your way through that, then you jump out of that space entirely, and you jump into Equinox. What did you did you have yeah. a moment in your life that you're like, man, I'm eating too much crappy food. I'm smelling too much great fragrances. I, I need to, I I need to get my health and my body back into shape. Is that what happened, or how did you it, make it kind that of leap? Did. Yeah, I did some soul searching, and I had been, been a member of the very original uh, Equinox Club on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, this was let's see, back in '93. Uh, and had really fallen in love with the brand. It was one of my love marks. You know, I'd been a member for a long time and I did some soul searching and realized that health and fitness as a category was something I was personally passionate about and mattered to me. I wanted to wake up every day and help people live fitter, fuller lives. Um, and so that was my dream job. And I went on the website and there happened to be the head of marketing role open. Uh, and so I applied for it, uh, got it. And uh, that was really what I would have at the time considered my dream job really. Uh, help expand overseas. We opened our first club in Europe in London, our, our second club in Toronto, uh, and led some of the international expansion efforts there, which was which was really fun. And so then what brought you to Ironman? So I was there for, at Equinox for four years uh, and really enjoying the job. And I got a call from a recruiter and uh, she said she had an incredible opportunity. And it was very much a global brand while Equinox was just starting to expand overseas. You know, Ironman had, you know, we ended up with let's see, 250 races in 53 countries around the world. So we had about 10 offices. Uh, we were acquired by a Chinese company that was headquartered in Beijing. Uh, so there was lots and lots of travel. You know, that, that idea of building a global brand, a truly global brand was really intriguing. Uh, and then I also got to um, be an executive producer of a lot of TV shows that we, we, we had on Iron Man. Uh, and that was kind of a, a childhood dream of mine. And uh, we were lucky enough to be nominated for five Emmys. And then I eventually won an Emmy award for best edited sports hey, program. Congratulations. Oh my gosh. So, so that was, do you have an Emmy? You, so you have an Emmy? I do have an Emmy. Yes. I have to tell you a story offline about Emmys in a conversation I had with, <laughs> with one of my neighbors, but that's hilarious. Uh, and cool. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. 
you know, the space itself is interesting. I, uh, I, we're probably somewhat similar age. I'm probably a little bit older than you just looking at uh, kind of when you went to college, I'm 51. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think many of us, or at least for me, once I hit 40, I realized, okay, I, I got to start taking care of this, this machine that I have. I never made it through to an Ironman, but I did do, you know, a bunch of 5Ks and then I did 10Ks and then I did a half marathon and then I did my first triathlon, which was here uh, in St. Pete. And um, it was amazing, you know, and then obviously then you get a little older, your knees get a little trickier and you figure out how to navigate your way through those parts. But Ironman is this really iconic legendary brand that still feels very, very relevant. I think I was surprised that they were in Tampa. I didn't know that until a few years ago. So again, mm -hmm. maybe they just kind of found this sleepy part of the country to be able to kind of navigate through. And so you were there for almost five years and it sounds like you really played a, an impressive part in kind of growing that brand. Yeah, we grew the brand to be the number one global leader in endurance sports. So number one uh, market share position in triathlon, number one market share position in running through the acquisition of the Rock Mill Marathon, uh, number one position in mountain biking as well. So we expanded beyond triathlon, really grew the brand, um, really iconic, like you said, brand that had so much potential that was untapped. Um, and we were able to unlock a lot of that. Uh, so that, that was very fulfilling. My buddy started the best damn race. I don't know if you ever heard of that one. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Thing, but, uh, that's my buddy. Nick yeah. We were actually in sales together. And then he was like, okay. hey, I'm going to start this. Uh, I'm going to start this, you know, this running thing. Up. I was like, okay, dude, whatever. And uh, off he went. It's a great race. It's um, a terrific race. So then you transition out of that and an opportunity comes up with Tonal. Yeah, I, I got a call from the same recruiter um, that had uh, talked to me about the Ironman job, uh, the same search firm. And uh, I hadn't heard of the product yet. It wasn't yet launched. And I uh, came out to San Francisco, um, had thought about working in a startup, um, but knew I wanted to stay in the health and wellness space and fitness. Uh, and when I went out and got a demo from the CEO, within about five minutes, I was completely sold that this was going to transform fitness forever. Uh, and and I, that was two years ago. And it's been an incredible, incredible journey ever since. I mean, you guys hit the ground running, you know, almost from the immediate moment that it started to kind of come out in the marketplace and the timing seemed to be premonition in some ways, you know, again, COVID is a thing everybody's being challenged with. There's certainly some aspects of it that have touched all of our lives at the same time. It has allowed many people to completely stop and assess and go, well, what am I doing with my life? I need to either take care of myself or I need to make sure that I'm staying healthy. And much of that has to take place at home. So it seems again, as if you guys, uh, were either in already kind of in the development of being uh, a big brand. And, and I'm assuming that there was probably an explosion over that time frame as well. Yeah, it, our founder Ali uh, started developing the product about six years ago. Um, incredible vision to condense, you know, the fitness equipment you would find at a gym into something the size of a flat screen TV. Um, you know, we have digital weights, which was really the unlock of technology that allowed yeah. us to create such an elegant sleek product that fits into your home. Uh, and then the intelligence that goes along with it. So we you know, have AI built in uh, that acts like you know, even better than a personal trainer to deliver an exceptional workout experience to get you stronger, faster. Uh, and we just got going and we're getting ramped before COVID. So we had our first TV commercial at holiday, had a very, very successful holiday season. Uh, February, March rolls around, we're getting ready to brace for our next big season and then COVID strikes and the world changes forever. And uh, to your point, the, the product is is very well suited for a COVID and post-COVID world. You know, when people are looking for alternatives and need something convenient and safe and effective. So, talk to us about how that had changed or has changed how you guys are out talking to the marketplace. Have you made any adjustments to how you're positioning the brand, or have you made adjustments to how, as a brand, you are talking differently to different consumers in different ways than maybe you anticipated? a year and a half or two years ago, really, you know, when you were kind of just getting into it? Yeah, great question. Well, our core equity is really about strength. Our brand promise is to help you be your strongest. Um, that's been our North Star that will remain. It's consistent. Uh, and we believe that it's inspiring and motivating to people. Uh, when, when COVID first struck, um, you know, the, this concept of working out from home was new to a lot of folks, right? And so, so that simple message really resonated with people and allowed us to, to start to reframe the workout experience from something that you would do at the gym to something that you would do at home. 
Peloton had certainly initiated the trend, uh, but we were really the first and only strength training product that was well suited um, in this market. And then sort of as the market started maturing and developing and becoming more sophisticated, um, really doubling down on our intelligence benefit and that umbrella had, has allowed us to differentiate ourselves versus any other product in the market. Well, you bring up a good point because again, it is this, the, the, the North Star for you guys in some ways is strength. For any of you that have run or any of you that have used Peloton or anything like that, those elements are great. Even running without, without a Peloton are, is great. It helps really build good cardio and your, your legs can get a little stronger, but it often doesn't do nearly as much as you think maybe in your head for the, for your upper body strength. And so at some mm -hmm. point then you, you just kind of think, okay, well, what about the rest of me? And that seems to be, again, this amazing place, you know, that, that you guys have been able to create technology to your point that can fit in a fairly small space within your home. That's right. Pel Peloton's a great product uh, for studio cycling and uh, delivers an entertaining ex experience. But to your point, um, there are 150 other machines in a, in a traditional gym and exercises you can do, and all of which can be done on tonal. And in addition, we've got cardio, we've got yoga, meditation, boxing. So all the cardio-based um, classes you can still have on tonal uh, with the addition of the equipment that delivers strength training. How does the product integrate in some ways with other providers like Apple seems super focused on health? How, how does it integrate yeah. with, with, with a product like Apple Watch or Apple in general? Great, great question. We have a- Which was not app, a setup, by the um, way. I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you that question. No, not at all. It's smart to ask. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's an easy question because Apple's such a strong partnership of ours. Um, we're very well integrated into Apple Watch. We've got apps on both uh, mobile and, on, and the watch. Uh, we can measure heart rate in real time um, and are continuing to, to expand that partnership even, even deeper. We also integrate with Strava. So, you know, we're, again, several platforms um, that you can connect to that will en enhance your experience on Tunnel. And so as a marketer, you know, again, it sounds as if you guys have formed great partnerships with big brands out there, which helps elevate mm -hmm. everybody. How are you playing off of those partnerships or what have been some of the interesting opportunities that you've taken to do cross partnerships to some extent. Is that something you guys have already started to do? Is that something you guys are looking to kind of do uh, in the future or where does that kind of fit? Since that's such a huge part of say, you know, Ironman, that's so much of that is sponsorship and those elements, where does that play? Absolutely. Well, we have a, a strong partnership with Theragun. Uh, and last year had a big promotion at Mother's Day where if you uh, got a tunnel, you could get a Theragun as part of the bundle for free. Um, and, and we incorporated, it wasn't just a superficial partnership. We actually have content uh, where it's you can recover after a, a, a tough a workout and incorporate Theragun into your recovery exercises. Yeah, if, if you never uh, used a Theragun, they're little. It's a big piece of heaven in your hand. It's amazing. <laughs> amazing. It certainly is. It certainly is, and there, it certainly helps with mus muscle recovery and and uh, you know preparation. So, and so lots of good you, synergy there because you guys are so tech he, um, tech forward to some extent. How are you building your marketing and your media around that? Are you still using some forms of traditional media? Is everything that you guys are doing kind of in the digital space or, or where, where does your marketing kind of live? Yeah, we're still building broad awareness. And so we're using a TV, both linear and uh, streaming uh, and digital prospecting, you know, sort of traditional broad channels. Uh, we have a great TV asset. We partnered with Anomaly as our agency. Uh, and so building top of funnel awareness there. We've got you know good mid funnel assets that are focused even more there over the over the coming year, uh, and then we've got 18 points of distribution across the country, so that you can go and feel and experience the digital weights firsthand. We also have uh, a virtual showroom where we do video demos. So if you don't want to leave your house and you want to check out Tonal, uh, we can have a one on one uh, demonstration with one of our uh, sales reps. You know, it used to be again. I'm 51. Back in the day when I first. I built my first agency. You bought a little radio. You made sure you had TV. I mean, now it's <laughs> so complex in some ways, but it does allow you to just be so precise in kind of moving a consumer through a channel properly and helping them to really discover a brand as opposed to just sell them. We also, you know, we often say solve, don't sell. And that seems to be, you know, really where, where the best passion seems to live. With a little bit of time that we've got left, um, let me ask you one more question, if you don't mind. Again, we've got Chris sure. Laurent. Chris is the Chief Marketing Officer at Tonal. 
Apparently, Chris and I have lived a doppelganger life uh, somewhere along the way, although he got to move to San Francisco. <laughs> I never got to live in that amazing city. So uh, uh, I'm the, you know, I'm the opposite or something. I'm not sure. But that said, uh, tell me, you know, if you had to think of it, do you have somebody who really gave you some great advice during all these amazing stays along the way? Is there somebody who gave you some good advice that you remember? Yeah, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is, is as a leader to have empathy. You know, empathy for, for your customers, empathy uh, for your team. Uh, and it kind of goes back to where we started, I think, with psychology and just understanding people and what makes them tick and, and how you best motivate and inspire them. And so at the end of the day, if people you know, wake up every morning, excited to come to work, if your consumers are delighted with your product and, and can leave your experience um, feeling better than when, when they came, you, you've succeeded. Great advice. Well, listen, Chris Stadler, thank you for joining us. You can go hit the beach now, grab your surfboard, whatever you're doing out there. But listen, if you don't follow Chris on LinkedIn, you should. Uh, of course, uh, you can stalk him from time to time, as I did, to get him on the show. We greatly appreciate you taking some time out of your time on your vacation or your workcation or whatever that combination of things is that you're doing. And we appreciate you spending some time telling us a little bit more about the brands that you've worked with in your journey along the way. Sean, really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the CMO Suite. Thanks for hanging out in the CMO suite. The podcast for marketers who want to be in the know. Presented by Connectivity Holdings. You're a C-level manager. You shouldn't have to know the difference between behavioral or contextual targeting. But your agency should. Uconnect provides brands and biddable teams direct access to platforms like the Trade Desk, Google, Amazon, Facebook, OTT, and more. Their U.S.-based traders can train your in-house team or provide complete transparency with no minimums and CPM-based service pricing for true transparency, something Mighty Hive, The Trade Desk, and Centro simply don't offer. Tired of being the smartest one in the room? Reach out to Uconnex today for a free demo. Uconnex, the world's leader in true, transparent, biddable media. This episode of the CMO Suite is also brought to you by Winmo. Winmo is the most comprehensive and widely used advertising database, providing an unfair advantage to media and marketing professionals nationwide. CMO Suite listeners receive complimentary trials of Winmo just by visiting winmo.com backslash CMO Suite. Don't forget to visit marketingcasts.com to find even more custom curated marketing podcasts just like this one. That's marketingcasts.com.